there'll be a, a missions offering we're given to all during the month of September. And again, the money stays right here in the Northwest to uh, plant churches and train new leaders. And so it's a, it's a great, uh, great way to be involved. Well, today is a special day for me. I'm celebrating 23 years of being married to my beautiful wife, Kelly. And so it's, uh, it's been a wonderful 23 years. We were talking this weekend how fast it's gone. I said, well, it goes by fast when you're having fun. And I think we've been having a lot of fun and, and raising kids and being part of this church the, the last uh, 14 years. Uh, not well, 14 years as a pastor in the last, wow, almost 40-some years as a, as a member of this congregation. So uh, thanks for your prayers for the next uh, 23 years and, and beyond. And, uh, and, and thanks for just uh, all your support and encouragement for uh, my wife and my, my, my kids and all of my family and myself. We are uh, continuing on through uh, Elijah's life and uh, looking at the, the life, the characteristics and character of this prophet Elijah, a lot of Old Testament, and so we're in 2 Kings 1, 1 through 18 today, and the title is, How Do We Come to Grips with the Toughness of God's Justice? Uh, now, this is, uh, you know, part of some scripture that, you know, I, I, I look at the scripture early in the week and Sometimes I just stare at the scripture and think, Lord, I need to pray to you and ask, what do you want me to do with this? <laughs> what do you want me to say uh, about this? Uh, and some of that uh, is because when we think of God's justice, when people in our society think of God's justice, they think of God's wrath and a, a wrathful, and they sometimes even think of an angry God. And, and because of that, they think of, wow, that's because of, that's where those judgmental Christians come from and judgmental Southern Baptists and you know and then there are some churches like Westboro Baptists and other churches you know that uh, act out in some ways that I think are unbiblical that even add to the commentary of the society that uh, we serve an angry wrathful uh, a God that hates people when they step out of line and and. And, and, and whenever this God has reason to, to see you step out of line, then he comes after you and wants to squish you out. And uh, this morning, I want to hope, I, I, I hope to give you some more reason and explanation of why God's justice and, and his wrath even is a beautiful thing and not an evil thing. Uh, I think there's plenty of detractors from that idea. I, I think many of uh, these lack of full understanding of what I'm going to try and share today, but there's plenty in society, in our culture, that uh, believe what I've just talked about, that, that God is this uh, angry, wrathful God, just w wants to destroy humanity rather than help us and whether, rather than love us. Uh, the magazine Vanity Fair in December 2015 published an article from actress Jessica Alba, uh, kind of a famous person, and, and, the, and this was the following paragraph about her views on God. It says, Alba's uh, childhood was marked by two things, lots of illnesses, and also a burning desire to leave her mark on the world. And uh, at age 12, she became a devout, uh, born-again Christian, she says. She said, I was seeking a purpose, Alba says, of her years as a member of a conservative Christian youth group. I wanted to exist for a reason, and this lasted until she was 17, year old, 17 years old when she says she was turned off by the boundaries and labels set by fellow churchgoers. Uh, that year, she attended an acting workshop in Vermont and fell crazy in love with a cross-dressing ballet dancer who had a baby and was bisexual. So I was like, there's just no way he's going to hell. Acting open to her new world of creative people, in a, in a, or acting opened up her new world of creative people in a community where she belonged. And I felt like at the end of the day, God is love and everyone is human. And I, I want you to listen to what she's saying in there. You know, she's, Sometimes our heart uh, misdirects us in ways or deceives us in some ways and saying, well, boundaries equals hate or boundaries or, or, or some kind of guidelines on the way we live is, is hateful or disrespectful or comes down on people. And we know in our marriages and our relationships that boundaries are often great things uh, that help us in our relationships. And, and so a free-for-all, do-whatever-is-right-in-your-own-eyes type of mentality often hurts relationships and hurts people. 
Uh, at its worst, it's, it's, this is one, one atheist, which you would expect a, an infamous atheist to say. This is Richard Dawkins that says the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character, he says, in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, a control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. And he goes on from there, and you just, just what you would expect from an atheist that writes books uh, you know, about his atheistic beliefs and things. But there are others like myself that disagree with, uh, with that and believe that the world needs some kind of framework to it, that needs some kind of level of guidelines in which uh, humanity, if we behaved by, if we lived by, it would, it would be much better for everybody. Uh, it'd be much better for everybody even to be able to survive and to live and to flourish. And, 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 and the commands of the Lord are not things that take away life, but to give life. Uh, and, and that's mostly because the heart of mankind is in desperation. It is desperately uh, evil and has a, a, a sinister bent towards sin. And is in desperate need of a heart transplant to go a different direction. We are in desperate need of, of a savior. Uh, John Lennox gunning, uh, wrote the book Gunning for God. And, and he, uh, he wrote this. He said, somewhere in Eastern Europe, there was an SS officer that watched with his machine gun cradled as an elderly and bearded Hasidic Jew laboriously dug what he knew to be his grave. Standing up straight, he addressed his executioner. God is watching what you are doing, he said. And then he was shot dead. Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mao, uh, the Gestapo, the brown shirts, the Nazi doctors, the, uh, some of the communist architects all believed that, uh, or didn't believe, that God was watching them. There is a benevolent, loving God that was watching them. That, that was a God not only of love, but that was a God of justice. Uh, a Christian man from the Republic of Congo barely survived the collapse of President Mobutu, uh, Mobutu uh, his government in 1997, and he and his wife and his uh, three daughters fled on foot to Uganda. They barely escaped many of the atrocities that they witnessed done to people in the streets of the Congo. And, and this man, uh, his name go is Emma, felt called to the ministry once he got to Uganda to start meeting the needs of his people back in the Congo. And he came to uh, be ministered and mentored by a, a Western uh, minister that began to disciple him. And Emma told this minister from the West, I could never believe the gospel if it were not for the judgment of God. Because I will ne never get justice in this world, but I couldn't cope if I was never going to see justice done. You ever think of God's judgment as being an attractional thing to the gospel? Well, for those people it is, and this is what Emma's pastor from America said, we in the West often recoil from God's justice for a very simple reason. We've hardly had to suffer injustice. But most people around the globe recognize that God's justice is praiseworthy and great. Of course, His mercy and redemption are even greater, but we need His perfect justice as well. Is there any amens in that? Any many men's about God's justice, about there being a benevolent, loving God where there will be a reckoning, where things will be brought into account, and some of the atrocities and outright horrible things that are done to people will be reckoned with? I think that is a great thing. With that in mind, we approach the word today in 2 Kings 1, 1 through 18, getting towards the end of the study on Elijah, and we, we, we approach that with this idea that God's justice really is good and humane, uh, despite all the things you're going to hear in the culture that almost sort of have a God on trial. So I want to address why then how it is that we need to, as Christians, to come to grips with God's justice and knowing that that's justice is very uh, a good thing. So here we are in, in 2 Kings 1, 1 through 18. It says there, After Ahab's death, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and injured himself. So he sent messengers saying to them, Go and consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to see if I will recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, 
Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went, and when the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, Why have you come back? A man came to meet us, they replied, and he said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and tell him, This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, you will not leave this bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. The king asked them, What kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? They replied, He had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, That was Elijah the Tishbite. Then he sent to Elijah a captain with his company of fifty men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell down from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. At this the king sent to Elijah another captain with his fifty men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says, Come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. So the king sent a third captain with his fifty men. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these fifty men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go, go down with him and do not be afraid of him. So Elijah got, got up and went down with him to the king. He told the king, this is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So he died, according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Because Ahaziah had no son, Jerome succeeded him as king in the second year of Jeroham, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. As for all the other events of Ahaziah's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of annuals of the king of Israel? So a very interesting story this morning. As you can imagine, I'm praying, Lord, what would you have me do with this? And the Lord began to insert two truths that I think we can draw uh, from this and so we kind of look back at the story and we said man This is after Ahab's death who Elijah had been dealing with in the past Ahab and then uh, Also his wife Jezebel who's going to see the end of of her about nine chapters in the second Kings Ahaziah is the new king of Samaria the northern kingdom of Israel And he apparently hurt himself just falling through some lattice up in his upper room where his, maybe his throne room is or where his sleeping quarters are and he he falls through and he hurts himself maybe Badly enough to where he is going to be bedbound for a while. And it sounds like he, like his predecessors, has been leading the northern kingdom, Israel, into idolatry. They've been following other gods. He's led them into not Yahweh, not Jehovah, but leading them into other beliefs and false teachings. And this is, in fact, the case with, with him. And, and, and at this point, and proves this, this, this case, he... Uh, Comparable to modern day palm readers or psychics, he sends off uh, his uh, consultants, his, uh, his court of people, his messengers, to go consult this foreign god that's like a psychic palm reader in, in, in a way to give him a report of whether he's going to be able to get well from his injuries. And an angel of the Lord comes to Elijah and says, Intercept these guys and ask the, the king's messengers to send back this message. And you know, our. Am I going to leave this bed? Elijah says, nope, you're going to die. You're going to die. You know, in the modern mind of America, in this pluralistic, free society we live in, this may sound harsh. You know, can't the king consult who he wants? Everyone kind of believes, uh, aren't their beliefs equal? Isn't just one belief equal to another? Shouldn't we just kind of live and let live? Isn't it sort of benign to believe what you want to believe? Shouldn't it be just... 
Just do, do you do what you want to do, and I'll do what you want to. Well, what I want to do because it's it's America, isn't it? That we're all God's children anyway, and He loves us. We're all human, isn't it? Jessica Alba's kind of idea. Hey, God is love, and He loves humans. We're all humans. We should just be accepting of everything and any, anything. Isn't everybody going to be good enough if they at least just try and do some good things? Aren't they going to go to heaven? Isn't it kumbaya amongst all of us because we're all just humans? Aren't we all imperfect anyway? Isn't God's just going to look on humanity and give everybody a mulligan or a pass on judgment day? Well, we live in a society that says that, the, that these things, uh, we, we can't imagine not being true because we're not used to seeing perfect judgments made. After all, hasn't there been some people found innocent on death row? Can you imagine those people that have actually been found because of DNA evidence and things? They, they've been found that they've been on death row for years and they were actually innocent? Haven't we seen judgments made by ourselves or others because of bias or prejudice? Haven't we acted... Uh, but sometimes being motivated by revenge hasn't our emotion at times got the best of us and deceived us in making a judgment and I think amongst ourselves we would have to answer yes, yes, yes but in coming to grips with the toughness of God's judgment there's some things we need to understand that are different than probably the understandings we have of humanity that are very different and here's one of them, here's the first truth His justice comes with pure motives and complete understanding. Now that's unprecedented. That, that's different than every person on earth and that his judge, judge, justice always comes with pure motives and complete understanding. Now when we judge someone, it may come from a selfish motive. It may come from uh, insecurity or our own fears. But when God's judges, judgments are pure. He's perfectly just. And he cannot allow sin or injustice in heaven. To get some help with this point, uh, I'm, I'm having my, my good friend Francis Chan, who I've met once, <laughs> but I've read some of his books. But we just have a video clip that kind of just encompasses, he's addressing some of the questions or some of the things people are thinking in our society many times. So let's just take a, a look at that for a moment. I believe the two scariest lies on the earth right now that are so prevalent are number one, you are a good person. And number two, because God is a loving God, he will not punish. I believe those are lies that are told every day all around our country and people are believing them. Number one, that you're a good person, that we're all good people. Every funeral you go to, you hear people say, he was a good person, she was a good person, they're in a better place, and we have this belief that, you know what, I do more good than bad, and I, I do a lot of good deeds. I think by nature, I'm a good person. The reason why that's a lie is because God says so. And in Romans chapter 3, he explains that all of us are sinners. None of us are good. In fact, in, in Romans chapter 3, he, he says that all, both Jews and Greeks, are all under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. In, in verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, you've got the world and probably many of your friends and maybe even your own heart and feelings telling you, I'm a good person. And then you have the word of God where God says, well, when I look at the world, I look down and I don't see anyone righteous, not even one. I see their sin and I see, he says, and the wages of sin is death. They all deserve this punishment. You've got to remember the things that God has done in history. Like when he looked at the world in, in Genesis chapter 6, and he says, gosh, I'm grieved. Look at the world. They're all so evil. I'm just going to flood the world and destroy them all. 
I'm sure there were people on the earth back then saying, I'm a good person. I feel like I'm a good person. All my friends say I'm a good person. But God looks at the world and says, there, there's no one righteous there. I'm going to destroy them. Except for Noah. Uh, I'll save him and his family. Everyone else, I'm going to flood. I'm going to destroy the whole world. You see, and it goes with that second lie that is so destructive, where nowadays people are saying, how could a loving God punish? There's no such thing as hell. I mean, God's not really going to punish me at the end of my life. Well, well, again, look at his actions. Would a loving God flood the whole earth? Yes, he would, because he's a God of justice and a God of wrath also. And again, you look, at, you look at the book of Revelation. It's all about, look at what this loving God does. In Revelation 20, it says, in verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So to say God is not a God who would punish, here he is tormenting someone, you know, the beast specifically and the false prophet, you know, is saying, you know what, they, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's God. And then it says later on in verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so you have this lie that everyone's telling you you know what, if God's a loving God, he, he, he wouldn't punish. He, and yet you look at the book of Revelation and people say, well, that's, that's old school. No, it's the book of Revelation. It's talking about the things that are going to happen. And so at some point we've got to say, who's the authority? Is it the culture nowadays that says, you know what, there's no punishment for sin. God's a loving God. He's not a God of wrath anymore. He's changed, you know, or is it the word of God that says, you know what, yes, he is a loving God. But he's also God of wrath. There will be a day of punishment. Look, these are two very destructive lies. Number one, that you're a good person. And number two, that God does not punish. We have to look at God's word and say, well, that's contrary to what this book says. And because of that, we all need this salvation from God. So the world's trying to teach you, the sa Satan himself is trying to teach you that look, there's no punishment, and you're a good person, this way you don't have to be saved from anything. And what the Bible says is no, we need Jesus. We need what he did on the cross for us. We need to be saved by him. So the difference between God and us is that God uh, moves with pure motives. And uh, he can make judgments. He can say, I see right through the heart of mankind and say, there's no one righteous. There's not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so, first of all, there's that the, he come, his justice in coming to grips, he, we need to know that he's got absolutely pure motives. And the second point I want to make is he has complete understanding. He sees everything and, and sees through everything and, and has all knowledge that's completely available to him from the beginning to the end. He sees it all at one time, standing outside of time and space. He's the only one in that unique situation uh, that can do that. Now, us as Christians, we are not in to step in and to bring judgments down on people uh, because we don't have pure motives and, and, and lack complete understanding, but God will judge uh, and, and so uh, the second point here is the, is the last year, you might remember in the paper or online news, social media, it was reported that Costco had put labels on Bibles that were being sold with the label fiction on it. Uh, and, and it went viral on social media. I remember getting all kinds of notifications and emails from people and things. Have you seen what Costco's doing? They believe our Bible, the Word of God, is fiction. And so it went into the, the millions and millions of people on social media were getting this notification to boycott Costco, to not buy books from them anymore. And, and with some simple investigation, although the damage is already sort of done, uh, with simple investigation, it was found out that a young man who worked at Costco has simply put the wrong labels on the wrong batch of books, on the wrong book, didn't know anything about the Bible, put the labels on there. And it caused Costco all this embarrassment and then later asking for apologies and things from one of their employees that put the label wrong. But millions and millions of people 
coming out against Costco at that time? Could it be that sometimes we jump the gun? Is it sometimes that we move without having all the knowledge necessary, that we get worked up, that we get manipulated when we, uh, people make us feel scared or threatened or people aren't respecting us, and we jump in and move forward. And, and sometimes out of revenge or out of spite, or anger come back against people and don't have all the understanding. Sometimes our self-righteousness, many times we move without all the facts. Uh, I know many of you know the story of Job, and he goes through great adversity without any knowledge of everything that's happening behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. And he's a very uh, righteous man. It says in, in, in the Bible here that he's a, a righteous man. Like God says, if you considered my servant Job, he's a, a righteous man and things to a, to a point, but still limited understanding, still with not the complete knowledge that only God has. And so out of this adversity, he begins uh, to many times question God. Like, why is all this happening to me? I don't understand. His wife tells him to curse God, which he, he does it, but he keeps on questioning. Why me? Why is this happening? And he begins to question God and question God as one chapter after another throughout Job until Job 38 is finally a point to where God says, okay, I'm going to question you now. And, and this is God speaking. I think I have it written down for you. Job 38, 1 through 11. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, who is this that darkens my counsel without knowledge? That's us. Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in its thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this is how far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Well, Job finally answers after two chapters of God questioning in this way. It goes on in Job 40, 3-5. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. You know, mankind, each of us, we, we have to admit about many things, but certainly spiritual things, there's a point to where we lack Knowledge. We lack the, the, uh, the spiritual eyes to see behind the scenes of all what is happening and, and seeing history from history to the future. Only God can do that. And God's able to make perfect judgments with perfect pure motives and with a whole encompassing understanding. So God can do that, but we can't. But in coming to grips when your friends are saying, if there is a loving God, if there is a true God that's so loving, why is this happening? And why is this happening? Why is this? There is some great explanations in the Word of God, but we need to begin with, He is God and we are not. And our understanding is going to be limited in some ways of trying to understand all those complexities. The second part of the story, incredibly, we see the king send a third captain to these three squadrons of 50 soldiers to come and bring Elijah back before the king. The first two are toast, literally. They uh, get burned up in fire. 102 men total pay with their lives, enveloped in burning fire from heaven. You imagine what you would feel like if you were the third captain being assigned to this mission after receiving the debrief notes from the previous two missions. Like, yeah, you want me to do what? Yeah, go on up there. The first two captains, 50, 100 men, been swarmed and just engulfed in fire, but it's your turn to go. You'll notice he comes to the next captain, doesn't say come down here, doesn't say come down here at once to Elijah. He, he falls on his knees and he says, please respect, please have respect for my life and the life of my men, your servants you know again in our western thinking that recoils against any kind of judgment or even authority 
I'm reading this, you know, like Elijah's on top of a hill. What's that mean? You know, top, top, uh, I, my mind goes to a green flowing hill, maybe sort of like a Mario Brothers video game, you know. He's on top of the hill, and these men of, are starting to kind of march up the, the green hill, and they're, they're telling him to, to come down. And, and so the idea is, is, is kind of an interesting picture in my mind of, of, of this captain. Now he's on pins and needles, on eggshells, slowly stepping foot on the hill, on, on his way, as in my mind goes to a Seinfeld episode from some years back of the Soup Nazi. Anybody ever seen that episode? There's a Soup Nazi. He's called the Soup Nazi because he's so mean to his customers that come into his shop and they have to be on pins and needles to earn a right to have some to buy some of this great soup in this New York, you know, soup shop. And and so uh, people that just annoy this person in any way, the Soup Nazi says, "No soup for you, no soup for you." You, you know, and they're like, oh, no, you know, and they ushered out of his soup shop. And, and so in no way am I comparing God to the soup Nazi, you know, and this, this God again up there is saying, you, you know, if you just annoy me or if you just bug me, then no soup for you. But, so this man of God on the top of the mountain, the way it describes his top of the hill, and now finally this third captain that comes to him and he approaches him in a different way and I think there's another lesson to be learned uh, about God's justice and that is we need to approach God's justice with a humble heart not coming with our demands now that's easier to do I think when we know that God has absolutely pure motives and he actually has complete understanding then that helps us to see who we are and who he is and so hopefully it would be obvious from that point. I know it hasn't amongst humanity and humanists that, you know, and the, the, the man on fire things happen out in Nevada and to celebrate how great human beings are and stuff. And you can imagine this episode, the pride of these two military officers, the first two. They are used to authority. They're used to telling this man to jump or that person to run into battle. And on penalty of their lives, their men listen to him. He tells us to go into, into in the line of fire. We go. And so those are the, these are strong men. These are men that are used to giving orders and orders being received and done. Like many today, you know, I know men, they're take charge guys and they come with a job to do. And if there's clear vision, clear directions, they want to just know what to do and what the job is and we'll get it done. Let's tell this silly religious guy, just come on down here, you know? But this doesn't work with God. We only come to God with a humble, childlike, teachable faith, not giving him our demands. We really know who God is, and we know he's a pure, uh, without any sin in him, we know Jesus was tempted in every way, but it says without sin. He's perfect. He was the perfect Lamb of God who was able to lay down his life. The blood of Christ cleansed us. Why? Because of the perfect blood of Christ that had no imperfections in it, that was able to cover us. And so we received the brunt uh, of, uh, he received the brunt of the justice that we deserved. That's why they call him the Savior. Sad thing is, I, deserve, I, I observe the world today and would maybe describe it as a time of great impatience, great anger and frustration with one another. I was driving down in San Diego on the way to the San Diego Zoo and coming up to a yellow light, and so I slowed down. It's a yellow light. I slowed down, getting ready to take a right turn. Slowed down and turned red, and I had a guy behind me start to honk his horn. And... Uh, turned green made the corner and this guy immediately whips around me gets right in front of me on this major, major boulevard and almost comes to a complete stop and so i slammed on my brakes and we begin to go about five miles per hour over the next half mile and kelly goes what, what are you gonna do i said i'm gonna just treat this guy like he's a wild animal and I'm not going to provoke him in any way. I don't know what's going on in the mind and heart of this person in front of us, but we're just going to move real slowly. We're not going to pull out around him. We're not going to get mad. We're just going to wait till this guy gets bored. And he drove like that for a minute, and he turned off to the left. He flipped us off, I guess, like Kelly said, as we went forward on our way to the zoo. But, but man, the animosity, the anger, 
the impatience, the demand. I want control. I want power. I want to run my own life. I want, if anyone gets in my way, if anybody slows me down today, look out. Because I'm a man with things that need to be done. I got places to go, things to do. God must look at it sometimes. And, you know, I remember the illustrations last week of how big the galaxies are. Every thumbprint, the 10,000 galaxies. He must look at man sometimes, just maybe with hopefully sympathy and empathy for how small and probably how disgusting our brains are and how big we think we are sometimes. But when I observe the world today, I just see that. A, t- a time of unmatched prosperity and wealth. At the same time, a time of great expectation, fast achievements, great opportunities, and a time when, when God isn't quickly being forgotten and not needed. He's blamed or demanded of, of is, is, if there's a God, why is such suffering? Why this? Why that? I need to know that. I need to have that answered or I'll never trust him. Yeah, I scarcely find many human beings that humbly accept anywhere close to the kind of responsibility that they put on God. I don't see human beings taking any kind of the responsibility that they themselves are giving excuses for not believing and entrusting themselves to God. They have all kinds of excuses. We have all kinds of excuses for our actions, all kinds of rationale for why we can do and believe what we can and and run in our own lives and do our own thing and and, and believe in humanistic things and atheistic things and and look at the culture and join right in and live as atheists, making decisions on a day-to-day basis as if there's no God. I want to finish with a video clip. I finished today before our time of communion with two characters from the movie Courageous and one of them is named David. He's a fellow officer who starts with the normal world world skepticism and demands but by hearing the truth from a loving believer you're going to see in the video clip his heart becomes more humble and less demanding. And I saw this clip I thought you know that's exactly I think where a lot of times people start but hopefully we'll finish in the place you can see this young man going. Hey, Nathan, can I ask you something? Yeah, what's up? Do you really feel like it messed up your childhood not having a dad? <laughs> More than you know. I struggled with who I was, trying to prove myself. Almost got in the game. You know, if fathers just did what they're supposed to do, half of the junk that we face on the streets wouldn't exist. Why are you worried about it? You nervous about being a father one day? I already am one. You got a kid? A little girl. She's four now. I was playing ball in college. Hooked up with a cheerleader. I told her to take care of it. She didn't do it. So I got mad and left her to deal with herself. You know, she lives 30 minutes away now. I can't bring myself to go see her. Is she married? No. I just never really loved her, you know? And then hearing you guys talk about how fathers walking out messed up the kids, and then seeing this stuff, I want to be one of those guys. David, part of being a man is about taking responsibility. Any fool can have a child. I'm just tired of feeling guilty. Let me break it to you this way. You are guilty. Listen, one day you, me, <laughs> and every one of us are going to have to stand before God. And he's going to do what good judges do. Well, then I hope my good outweighs my bad, Nathan. That's not the way it works. You know that. Let me put it this way. Who's the person you're closest to? Probably my mom. Okay. Suppose she was brutally attacked and murdered in a parking lot. The guy was caught and put on trial. But he says, hey, judge, I committed this crime, but I've done a lot of good in my life. 
If the judge let him go free, would you say he was a good judge or a bad judge? A bad one. That's right. Because the Bible says that God is a good judge, and he will punish the guilty not for what they did right, but for what they did wrong. Because he loved us, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment that we deserve and put it on himself. And that's why he died on the cross. But it only applies if you accept it. That's why I asked for his forgiveness. I asked him to save me. And I'm a new man because of Christ. You understand what I'm telling you? Then what's holding you back? Nothing. <laughs>